Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, how's everyone doing this evening? All right, fantastic. Well, we anticipate that the room will fill up uh, as we progress through the presentation, but uh, before we get started, just wanted to uh, introduce myself. My name is Sean Washington. I am a captain at the police department. So I oversee the Special Investigation or Special Operations Unit um, at the police department, which basically consists of all of our detectives. Um, so on behalf of Chief Richard Lucero, who would uh, normally be here today, I'm kind of filling in for him. Um, and he wanted to pass along his sincere thanks for all of you showing up today to participate in this presentation. Um, we believe that this is valuable information for all of you, as well as the rest of the community, to help protect you against some of the most more common um, types of crimes associated with uh, the holiday season. So we hope that you uh, find this useful. Um, we, uh, th the detectives have put together, I think, a fantastic presentation that uh, I think we can all benefit from. I appreciate the, um, these type of meetings because A, obviously we police any community, law enforcement polices any community with the consent and the cooperation of the public, right? We serve, we work for you all. And so it is a partnership. It's the police department, but really the partnership is the cooperation we get from our community. A lot of the success that we've had traditionally has been a, a direct result of our participation and our cooperation with the community. We solve most of our crimes because you guys help us solve the crimes. So, you know, presentations like this are very valuable indeed. So before we get started, just a few ground rules. Um, the uh, detectives here are going to go through the presentation. Uh, you're probably going to have some questions as the presentation progresses, but uh, to be respectful of everyone's time and to make sure that we can get through all the material, I just ask that you make a mental note of that question and then we'll have some time at the end in which you can raise your hand, answer those questions. Now, um, we're scheduled to go to about 8.30. Uh, some of the detectives might have to skip out and leave um, right at 8.30 or a little bit before. If for some reason we can't answer all the questions that you have today, we'll take your name, we'll take your information, and we'll follow up with you, okay? I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to get their questions answered, for sure. Um, please turn off any cell phones. I know we still have to stay connected, as do I, but put it on vibrate or low volume or something like that. Um, if you forget, no problem. <laughs> um, no problem, we're not gonna um, um, you know, kick you out or anything like that, but we just ask just to be, just so it's not disruptive uh, that you silence your, your cell phone. So with that, I'm gonna stay through the presentation as well. If you have any questions for me specifically, which I doubt because these folks are the people who do uh, the actual work at the department, um, I'll be hanging around back as well. So with that said, um, I think it's time to get started and I will turn it over to Sergeant McCormick. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So um, just to kind of follow up on what Captain Washington said, um, we're gonna try to address all your questions at the end, but again, if, if we don't get to it, or if there's a, a time where you have a question after this presentation, you can certainly reach out to us and we will try to get back to you as, as quickly as possible. Um, I don't want to take it up too much time, but I'm just going to kind of give you a general overview of the investigative unit uh, that Captain Washington oversees. Uh, there are actually two investigative units. Um, one of them is the Crimes Against Persons Unit, and they're primarily responsible for investigating crimes, violent crimes like uh, sexual assault, robbery, homicide, any kind of uh, ch uh, crimes against children, that type of case. Um, and then on the other side of the hallway is my unit, which is the general assignment unit. And we primarily investigate property related offenses such as uh, residential burglaries, commercial burglaries, auto theft, uh, auto break ins, uh, identity theft, and um, you know, those type of crimes. And what I can tell you is that uh, although Fremont is a very safe uh, neighborhood uh, community with respect to violent crime, we do have our fair share of property-related offenses. And so when a, a crime of that nature gets uh, perpetrated, um, patrol officers go out there and take the primary investigation. You'll see them as CSOs or uniformed patrol officers. They'll go out and take the primary report, 
And then based upon the solvability factors that are involved in each and every case, um, I look at every case and I make a determination as to whether or not I'm going to assign it to one of my detectives for follow-up. Um, as you can see, we have six burglary detectives who uh, primarily investigate burglary-related offenses. I have two fraud detectives who, had, who investigate all natures of fraud, um, identity theft, online scams, and then I have uh, one detective that's assigned to a regional task force that deals primarily with computer forensics, and then I have another uh, detective who is assigned to another task force which deals with mostly high-tech crimes or crimes involving large-scale theft of uh, computer-related components. So uh, I supervise 10 detectives, eight of them are in-house. Um, so you can see that the, although we have a very large community, uh, we really only have a small number of detectives. And so it's my responsibility to triage those cases and assign those cases that I think, based upon the facts of the case, are going to get us the greatest results. So oftentimes people will call in and say, hey, are you going to investigate my case? My house was broken into, my items were taken. And uh, unfortunately, in, in many of the cases, because there's no evidence or anything to follow up on, uh, we just don't have the resources to investigate those cases. So what I think this presentation will um, hope to accomplish is to give you some tools, some resources, some guidance to help prevent you from being a victim in the first place. But also, if you do happen to be a victim of any kind of property-related offense, maybe give you some tools or some guidelines on how to best um, uh, help us catch the perpetrators through video surveillance and, and so on and so forth. So without much ado, um, I don't know if there's a way we can put the, the uh, present. There we go. So if you could come up here, I th um, I'll do some real quick introductions. Like I said, my name is Paul McCormick. I'm the sergeant uh, in charge of uh, the general assignment unit. Uh, I'll go through and introduce all the detectives that are present here tonight, and then they'll jump into their presentations. And then, like we said, at the end of the presentations, we'll have an opportunity to uh, go through and answer any questions. Uh, first off is Detective Travis McDonald. He's uh, my right-hand man. He's, uh, he's kind of my go-to guy. He's been in the unit for uh, several years, and he's in a semi-permanent status, which means that he's going to be there for quite some time. So he's kind of the, the guy that I lean to uh, when it comes to making decisions related to assigning cases. Uh, Detective Boyd is not here tonight. She is one of our uh, fraud investigators, and her uh, counterpart in that endeavor is Detective Adam Foster. And then Detective Stone is unavailable tonight, and there's our, our burglary investigators. Uh, Detective Sanaceros right behind me. Uh, Detective Stilatano right there. Detective Johnson, Natasha Johnson. And then finally, Detective Brian Holyfield. So this is uh, your uh, general assignment unit, and these are the folks that are going to be going out there and, and doing all the good work to help recover the property that is taken and help uh, catch those offenders who are out there committing those crimes. Uh, what I can tell you real quickly is that in 2013, the uh, police department initiated a project called Operation Sentinel. And essentially, in a nutshell, what Se Operation Sentinel was, is it was uh, an intelligence-led policing effort where we focused not necessarily on the crime, but we focused on the criminal. And the reason we did that is we found that the vast majority of crimes committed in Fremont are committed by a very limited population. And a lot of those folks that commit crimes in Fremont, surprisingly enough, don't even live in Fremont. They come from outside the area. They know the demographics of Fremont. They know that this is a um, upper scale, upper class community, mostly residential. And so it is, um, for lack of a better term, it's a, it's a, it's a good place to go if you were a criminal. Um, so just to kind of give you some real quick stats, since initiating that, if I can get my phone to work here, um, since initiating that uh, endeavor, um, I can tell you that in 2013, I'm sorry, 2012, the year before we initiated the Operation Sentinel, Fremont had 916 residential burglaries, which is about three burglaries per day in the city of Fremont. Um, and since that time, uh, the last recorded yearly stats was 2015, and in 2015, we recorded 535 residential burglaries, so a, a fairly significant drop in a very short amount of time. And while I, I would like to say that the, the lion's share of the credit goes to the police department for solving all that and, and doing that, 
really, like Captain Washington said, it's also um, a, in response to the efforts that you have citizens have, have done in making our community safer. And that's through making phone calls, calling in those suspicious activities, going through video surveillance and uh, installing video surveillance so that if we do get a crime, uh, we're able to look at video surveillance and go after the perpetrators. So it is, as Captain Washington said, it, it is a collaboration between you of the citizens and us as the investigators. And I think if we continue down those the, that road, I think we're going to see a continuing fall in, in our crime stats. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, I think Travis is going to be our first one. So again, thank you for your time, and uh, we'll see you at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Sergeant. Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good day. Good evening. I'm going to speak about residential burglary prevention. And folks, you're going to see me probably peek up here once in a while over at the screen. It's just to keep me on, keep me on course because I'll sit here and talk to you guys all night long. So residential burglary prevention. Residential burglary, does, does everybody know what that means? Okay. I'm sure everybody does. So basically what it is, is we're just going to give you guys some, some, some facts about residential burglaries that happen in the city of Fremont and then some ways to maybe present, prevent you and your families from uh, becoming victimized, or at least, at the very least, make it harder for these people to victimize you and your families, okay? So residential burglary became a, whoa, lost me. Already we're off on that one. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So residential burglary became a very high priority um, for the uh, administration here uh, to, to combat. Um, back a few years ago, we realized that we had a, a significant residential burglary and property related crime uh, problem in the city. And that was um, something that the, the chief made a, a primary goal that he wanted to address and he wanted to address it aggressively. And that's where, like what Sergeant McCormick was talking about, where Operation Sentinel came from. Uh, the goal was basically to keep residents safe and prevent property theft. That's what the, that's what Operation Sentinel um, was designed for, and that's what uh, that's why it's been so successful. Um, and like Sergeant McCormick said, we have six uh, Fremont PD detectives assigned uh, to investigate uh, residential burglaries, as well as a couple others. And we work very often with other outside agencies, other units inside of our uh, inside of our uh, police department as well. Uh, we work all the time with uh, with these units and uh, we've seen some very good success. <clears throat> so we're gonna go over just a few of the burglary trends here. So um, we have found through the, the data that we've gathered and, uh, and analyzed that uh, most residential burglaries are occurring between about 8 a.m. and about 4 p.m. Anybody have any guess why those are the times that they're occurring? Everybody's at work. Everybody's gone. There's nobody at the, uh, nobody at home. So that's that's a that's the primary time that these are happening. Now, obviously, there are times that these happen outside of that, um, but this is the this is what we've broken down and, and figured out. So, and uh, oftentimes uh, we found that the suspects that are involved in these kinds of crimes they will try and make contact at the house prior to finding a way to break in. And by contact, we mean usually knocking on the door. They'll stay in there. They'll knock on the door. They'll ring the doorbell. You've probably seen some YouTube videos or videos on, you know, online or um, uh, through the news media that you know you see somebody knocking on a door and then you find out later that that house got burglarized. What these people are doing is they're checking to see if anybody's home. And if they are and you answer your door, generally they'll have a, kind, of a, kind of a real quick story. Oh, is Jimmy home? I'm looking for my dog. Can I borrow your phone? You know, something like that. And then they'll generally go on about their way realizing that that's probably not the place they hit. So that's one way that they are probably trying to find out if that's going to be a good good target to uh, a good uh, residence to, to target for burglary so uh we're talking about some common methods of entry by entry i mean how these people are actually getting into your homes we've found that uh i think it was almost one in four of our burglaries were uh, committed um because the uh, the residents had left either a window or door unlocked unlocked or unsecured, especially like during the summertime when it's hot, people don't want to run their AC all day. They want to come home to a nice cool house. They leave a window open. That is uh, that we've, we've found that a lot of suspects, that's how they're getting in. They're, they're getting in because there was nothing to prevent them from, from, from breaking into their house outside of just an open window. Uh, we're finding that uh, another common way is that these suspects will uh, either pry or smash open a window just to get in. These are not particularly bright people that are breaking into people's homes, okay? They'll, they'll just use brute force sometimes to get in these homes, whether it's throwing a rock through a window um, or prying open a window with, uh, with some kind of tool. 
Uh, another way we found, it's a less common way, but it does still happen, is what we call a door kick or a body force entry. And that's where someone will just use their feet or their shoulder or whatever it is and just break in through a door. Whether it's an exterior door, they get them into a garage and then they can get into the, the, the residence through uh, the interior door or, or whatever that does happen. We do see that, um, you know, not, not too frequently, but it, it does still occur. That is another method that we're, uh, that we're seeing people break into other people's homes. Um, common property that's taken, it's included, but this is definitely not limited to small electronics, iPhones, iPads, tablets, computers, uh, TVs. I see a lot of TVs getting, getting taken now. Uh, jewelry, gold right now is a big thing. If, they can, if these, these folks get into people's homes and they can grab gold, the gold is, they can turn it around for cash within an hour, two hours of, of that burglary. Very, very quick turnaround. Uh, we're seeing a lot of things like uh, firearms being taken. These people that are breaking into the homes, a lot of times these are street gang members and they are trying to arm themselves so they can deal with other street gangs that they're at war with and whatnot. So we are seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of firearms that are being targeted. And uh, then of course you've got just your normal currency, cash left in the house, checkbooks, uh, credit cards, things like that that are left uh, unsecured and inside of a residence. Um, we are seeing a lot of that being, being, uh, being taken as well. So prevention, these are just some ideas. They may work for you, they may not work for you. It's up to you guys to decide, you guys are homeowners. So we're just gonna give you some ideas and some things to think about with how to make your houses a little more secure and make yourselves less appealing to be victimized. Number one, it sounds, sounds silly, lock all your doors and windows. That will, you will, if people would start doing that a little bit more often, you will start seeing our burglary numbers go down even more than they already have. That is, that is, you know, one in four of these is, is because people are leaving doors uh, unlocked and uh, windows unsecured. Another good way to keep things in your house is to lock them all into a safe. Now, I don't mean just like a little safe that you can get on eBay for 60 bucks that you can just slide into a closet and, you know, you can move around your house like the size of like a bread box. I'm talking a good size safe, some, one that you can bolt to a wall or you, you can secure to your, to your, to your floor. Uh, I have a safe in my, my garage of all places. All of my firearms go in there all of our paperwork for our children, anything like that that we need to definitely keep, we put in that safe. It is bolted to the ground. They're not going out of there with that safe. That's where we keep all of our valuables. Um, it's also fireproof, which you know, we'll see how that goes. But anyways, that's, uh, that's, that's definitely the route to go. If you're gonna get a safe, spend the money and get yourself a safe that you can bolt down to uh, a wall or the, uh, the floor. Uh, display alarm signs or stickers. This actually goes quite a long ways. Um, some of the suspects that we've talked to, and a lot of them will talk to us, and they'll tell us their methods and why they do what they do and how they get into houses and why they choose houses, they will tell us, I don't go near homes that have alarms because they're unpredictable. Do you have a window break alarm? Do you have an alarm that's just gonna open if it slides? Do you have motion detectors? It's too risky. And if somebody sees that your house is all lit up with stickers, whether or not you have an alarm or not, they are probably not going to pay much attention to that house. They're probably gonna go try and find a better house to burglarize. They're easy to get. You can get just the stickers alone. You can spend a couple bucks and get them online. They're cheap. It is a very easy way to um, make yourself look unappealing, even if you don't want to spend the money on a high-tech system. <clears throat> Install locks on all side gate access points. Um, what I mean by that is like a little padlock or a little key lock that you can put so that your side gate access, you can't just pop that thing down and walk right through the back. Um, we've seen it a million times where once the suspect gets in that backyard and it's the middle of the day, they can, they can do whatever they want in that backyard as long as they want because they're there and they're concealed. And it's real hard unless your neighbor is outside or somebody else is outside to see, hey, this guy just walked into my neighbor's house and I don't know, you know who they are. It's really, really, um, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult for them and make it, we're trying to make it more difficult for them. So if they can just punch their way through the, the gate, then they're in the backyard. If you've got a lock on that gate and that gate is secured and they have to jump the fence to get over it, that's pretty odd. And generally people are gonna notice that kind of stuff if they're out and about and you know your neighbors and whatnot, and they happen to see somebody jump over somebody's fence. I know my neighbors, they're all gonna call the police right away. If they see somebody go over my fence, cause I've got a lock on my gate. If they see somebody go over my fence that isn't me, they're gonna call. And that's the kind of thing that we want. We want you folks to be there for your neighbors and to secure your own, secure your own uh, houses as well, as best you can. Uh, installing exterior motion lights. This is another 
fairly uh, cost-effective way to um, prevent or deter these uh, these people from targeting your homes. Um, you can get them at Home Depot, Lowe's. You can get them online. You can get them on Amazon. All kinds of stuff. Really easy to install. Just takes a few minutes, and it's their mo- their motion lights. Just like it says, as soon as the light goes on, you know that person. If they're creeping around in your yard and it's dark out, and all of a sudden the light comes on, they're probably not going to stay in that yard too long, unless they believe that you're not home. So those are just an, another easy way to, you know, save a little bit of money and at the same time make your house a little bit less desirable. Uh, and then this is this is a big one that we kind of push pretty hard: is invest in an alarm or surveillance camera system. There are a million different alarms. There are a million different surveillance systems out there. We certainly are not going to recommend vendors or anything like that. But just having something in your house, anything in your house, it's a deterrent. Especially if you've got that coupled with a bunch of, you know, display alarm signs and, or uh, alarm signs that are on display and with stickers and things like that. It's going to go a long way if somebody is walking your block, looking to victimize somebody and break into somebody's house. And they see those things. They see the cameras outside. They see the stickers outside. They are not going to want to go into your house. And if they are, they're dumb because you're going to we're going to catch them. It's just that simple. Uh, these these uh, alarm systems, and these surveillance systems, they make them they make them great now. They've got phenomenal, phenomenal cameras out there. They just get great pictures. We get people that, that work with us all the time that are that's that's what that's one of our primary ways that we catch people is we get good people like you care about your community that call us and go, I just saw this weird car and they were driving around. And I think they came out of my neighbor's yard and here's a great picture of it. And then we can go run with that. We do that all the time. That's how we wind up catching people because people have got good surveillance systems and then they call us. It's 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 really a very uh, effective way for us to uh, to do follow up work and find these people that are breaking into people's homes. And with that, I am going to end my portion of the uh, the presentation. I greatly appreciate you guys coming out tonight. You obviously care about your community. You care about wanting to interact with us, and we love that. Thank you very much for coming out here. I'll be happy to stick around and answer any questions you have at the end of the presentation. And I think Natasha is up. Hello, I'm going to present to you tonight about auto burglars as well as vehicle thefts. You're going to see some trends tonight on uh, how to prevent these things. Oftentimes what burglars do and thieves, they like the easy way, right? So you're seeing the theme of put up maybe some signs, lighting, make it harder for someone to want to choose your car and move on to the next easiest car to steal or house to burglarize. So before we get into all that, we're gonna talk about some burglary, auto burglary facts. Uh, let's see here, approximately $1.26 billion worth of items were stolen from vehicles. Um, and vehicles, as Travis was speaking about, approximately a fourth of homes are left unlocked and people go into there as a crime of opportunity. Same with vehicles. So you wanna make sure to roll up your windows, lock your doors, make sure your vehicle is completely secure to help prevent a burglar from getting into it. Um, it can take approximately just under 30 seconds for someone to break into your car, take what they want and go. So it's a very quick occurring crime. And uh, most common things that are taken are what's left out. Things that you guys want are things that thieves want as well. So those are sunglasses, sometimes stereo systems will break in just to steal the stereo system, computers, purses, anything that you don't want someone to take, don't leave in there. So I was, uh, as I was already getting into burglary prevention for automobiles, uh, you want to park in a well-lit area if you live in an apartment complex. Sometimes you can't necessarily choose where you park, so you have assigned parking and there's visitor parking, but do everything you can to park in an area that is well-lit. If they are going to choose a car and your area is lit up like Christmas tree, then they'll likely possibly move from your car onto another one because when you're in the shadows and doing this at night, they're not going to see you as likely if, you are, uh, if your vehicle is parked in the light. Um, as we were talking about, you want to place everything that you want that you keep in your car outside of your car. Or if that's not possible, let's say you're uh, at work, you have to bring your laptop with you and then you go to lunch, you still have your laptop, you don't want to bring it into your lunch spot, put it in the trunk. If they can't see it, they don't know it's there, hopefully. 
Um, let's see here. What else do we want? Like we were saying, conceal everything and make sure everything's all locked up. You don't want to leave anything of value in your car. If you want it, don't leave it in there. And if you have to, make sure it's concealed. So as we've been talking about, the theme is uh, try not to give someone a chance to victimize you. Sometimes it's a crime of opportunity. They uh, are suspects will walk around. They'll look for something easy. If you're not the easy, if your home's not the easy one to get, if your car's not the easy one to get, then it's possible that they'll move on. Now, as continue with the same theme, vehicle thefts. So that's when your vehicle, your whole vehicle itself is stolen and taken away. How many people here have been a victim of a vehicle theft? Okay, it's definitely a feeling that someone violates your privacy. Um, not only that, it's expensive. When they steal your vehicle, it's often damaged. And that's something that you can turn over to your insurance. Oftentimes, insurance companies, you can have a $500 premium or a $1,000 premium or possibly higher. And you can either choose to pay that and then incur increased insurance rates for a while after that or pay it out of pocket. So it is a very frustrating thing. I've definitely been a victim of it myself. And it is, like I said, it's feeling a violation and frustrating. So the most common vehicles that are stolen are older Hondas and Toyotas. Uh, oftentimes what crooks will do, they will have a shaved key. A shaved key is uh, any kind of car key and you just shave the sides of it so it becomes more flat and it will fit into the keyhole. Uh, with my car that was stolen when I was in college, I could truly open up the uh, lock to the car, the handle, and uh, do it with the corner of my credit card. That's how bad it was, the 1996 Ford Escort. Uh, I could start the ignition. Uh, just the tip of the key in there. It was uh, great for college, very cheap, but uh, not the best. Needless to say, after it was stolen when I became a police officer, I got a new one. Um, but unfortunately, these cars are very easily to steal. Uh, and along with the commonly stolen vehicles, full-size pickup trucks are stolen. Oftentimes, uh, pickup trucks and vans are work vans or trucks, and people like those for all the tools inside of them. Fortunately, if you work construction, uh, you may have been a victim of this if you have a work truck. They're often targeted for that. So uh, we're talking about auto burglaries can occur in less than 30 seconds. A vehicle theft can occur just under a minute. Truly, if you uh, have the right tools, the scissors can get you in the car, a butter knife, a shaved key, unlock it, get in, start it, and you're gone. So for prevention, it's gonna be along the same lines as prevention for home burglaries and auto burglaries. You wanna try and park in a well-lit area. Don't leave your vehicle unlocked. Uh, and if you do have any anti-theft devices, so if that's a car alarm, um, anything to secure your ignition, any kind of engine lock, you wanna try and put those on every single time. And if your car is stolen, it is important for you guys to have the information of your vehicle. So uh, oftentimes everyone keeps their registration and stuff like that in the car and you don't necessarily know your license plate number. What happens when you know your vehicle is stolen, you have to call our dispatch and the first thing they ask you, what's your license plate number? I don't know, it could take them a handful of minutes to look it up. Sometimes we drive vehicles that don't necessarily uh, are registered to us. So let's say I drive my husband's vehicle, but it's only registered under him, so it takes much longer for dispatch to find it, rather than if you know your license plate number, they can enter into the system much faster, and therefore, we, when your vehicle's entered into our stolen vehicle system, any officer in the whole country that sees it, runs the license plate, then it'll come up as stolen. Uh, along the same lines, for when your vehicle is stolen, or let's say if your uh, vehicle is burglarized. First thing you want to do when your vehicle is burglarized, you want to look through and see what they took. Well, when you look through and see what the suspects may have taken, you leave your fingerprints more in the car, and therefore when the officers come to check for fingerprints in the car, after you've touched everything, the officers aren't going to be able to print it because likely all they're going to get is your print. So if you uh, get your vehicle back from either it being stolen or if you are a victim of an auto burglar, you wanna make sure to wait until the officer gets there to touch anything inside your vehicle. 
And that's about all I got on that. And I believe next is going to be package thefts by Detective Silitano. Good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Nino Silitano. I'm one of the six burglary detectives. So I hope to be as half as eloquent as the first two speakers, but we'll, uh, we'll try to get through it either way. So uh, the crime that we're talking about uh, that I'm going to present about is package thefts. Uh, some see it as less serious, but it's much more pervasive. Uh, it affects you know every neighborhood because in every neighborhood people are going to buy packages online. They have them delivered at their front porch, and you know if somebody sees them, something on their front porch, a bigger package usually is a bigger prize, and that's going to get taken. So, uh, one of the most the most common form of package thefts is usually going to be the typical thing. A you know UPS, UPS, they drop something off on your front porch, but we also see it at uh, commercial buildings or in apartment complexes. Um, again, it's one of the more prevalent crimes that occur in uh, within the city of Fremont, any kind of residential area, uh, but especially during the holiday season. And this is mainly because uh, typically the average value of a package delivered more than triples during the holiday season. And that seems pretty logical. You tend to buy nice presents for, uh, for your loved ones. Uh, this also makes it one of the more aggravating crimes uh, for for you folks because it doesn't affect just you. You, know, you could always buy something else for yourself, but it typically affects a loved one, a child, someone you're going to buy a present for. So uh, one of the more difficult things about this crime to investigate, one is it happens very quickly. Uh, usually uh, it happens in a couple different ways, but typically either a suspect's going to be following a UPS truck and waiting for it to make delivery and then sees it, you know, make a delivery of a nice big package, maybe in a convenient spot for them to take it. Or maybe they're just driving through the neighborhood and, again, they're looking for the bigger packages, assuming they get a bigger prize out of it. Um, the other difficult thing for us to investigate is that unlike a, a burglary or a vehicle theft, which you come home, see your, your house is broken into or your car is missing, you're going to report that typically right away. Um, with a package theft, sometimes you assume, okay, well, UPS or you know DHL, maybe they're delayed a couple of days, and you go online and you find out, oh, it's delivered, and then you got to make some follow-up phone calls. So sometimes there's a delay in reporting, or it doesn't get reported at all because maybe the value of the package is so low that you say, okay, I'll just buy another one, or maybe you got insurance and it's going to uh, get taken care of. So, so that makes it difficult for us because. Uh, sometimes suspects will steal, you know, 15, 20, 25 packages before it even starts to get reported and become a trend for us to look into. Uh, one of the other things that's aggravating for you folks is that usually people aren't buying insurance for packages maybe under 100 bucks. So unlike maybe um, credit card fraud that uh, Detective Foster is going to talk about, you're not going to be compensated by uh, the company you buy it from or the shipping company unless they can, you know, you have some sort of insurance for it. So the things we're going to talk about today as far as prevention, they go into two categories like uh, Detective Johnson was talking about. Half of them are to prevent the crimes from happening in the first place, deter it, you know, make you the less likely victim. Uh, and then the other half of things are kind of for our benefit to make it a little bit easier for us to follow up and actually investigate these crimes. So first and foremost, um, install video surveillance. And I think you're going to hear that as a reoccurring theme uh, throughout the night. It's uh, one of the greatest tools that uh, are afforded to us in you know, this 21st century of policing is we get to actually uh, record the crime uh, actually taking place. So uh, when it comes to us following up on it, if we get a nice big picture of high resolution of somebody taking you know, your $1,000 sound system that, that was left on your porch, then we could you know, send that to the media, we send it to other police officers in the county throughout the department, and if it's a well-known crook, usually someone can say, yep, I know that guy, I just arrested him last month. Uh, and Detective Holyfield is going to talk more about uh, surveillance cameras, but they are a, a huge asset for us. Uh, the other thing is also people tend to notice, uh, crooks will tend to notice when a house does have surveillance cameras, so it provides a good deterrent as well. Uh, so a bunch of options for you guys to help prevent this crime to happen in the first place. Uh, package, uh, if you can have your uh, packages sent to the company itself, so if you buy something, let's say from uh, Brookstones, you guys, you guys know where Brookstones, right? Cool electronic gadgets. So uh, oftentimes, instead of buying it online and having it shipped to your house, you can ha pick it up straight from the store. Uh, so if that's convenient for you, maybe Walmart, Target, they have that option. So instead of delivering it, just go down to your local uh, Walmart, Target, wherever, and pick it up there. Uh, another related option is having it sent to a shipping facility. So if you're ordering through UPS, uh, there's a bunch of shipping hubs or shipping facilities. I know there's one in Fremont, and you can request that they just keep it at the shipping center, and you'll drive down there. So if it's not a local store, maybe it's an online-only retailer, 
uh, they can have the, the package left there at the hub so you can drive over there and pick it up. You can have uh, time specific deliveries. So uh, you can request to have you know, a delivery made only after a certain time and not every shipping courier is gonna have that option for you. But if you work a very specific uh, schedule like a nine to five kind of thing and you know no one's gonna be home before five o'clock, you can request to have a package sent or delivered within a specific time frame. Uh, this is a big one. So I did this recently. I upgraded to an iPhone 7. It's fantastic. I recommend it highly. Um, but you track your packages. So obviously I knew that I wasn't going to be home before about 5 o'clock. And I knew that it was going to get delivered between 11 and 3. So I said, all right, I'm going to coordinate with my neighbor because I don't want it to get stolen because I don't want to pay for insurance. And I had my neighbor come over as soon as I got the email alert, hey, your package is delivered. Have your neighbor come over and pick it up for you which leads into my next one. So I have a neighbor pick it up. So if you have uh, maybe a neighbor that stays home uh, all day, a retired neighbor or something like that, uh, just ask them, hey, listen, I'm, I'm waiting for a couple packages. Do me a favor and just you know, look out your window. And uh, I think sometime today I should be getting a package. Uh, the last one here, I'm sorry, this is not the last one. I have more slides. Uh, use your workplace as a shipping address. Um, the caveat to this is you want to ask your, your workplace, your employer, if that's going to be okay. But uh, typically it's much safer to have something shipped to a workplace and if, especially if there's like a receptionist there that can sign for the packages, that's actually uh, much safer. So uh, another option that almost every shipping courier has is to require a signature for delivery. So this is uh, very good for uh, the high-end uh, electronics, anything high dollar amount, but request that uh, it's a signature only. So the, the thing with this is sometimes the more expensive packages that'll come pre-required where you know if you buy again like my phone it required me that I had assigned for the package when it gets there uh, most uh, couriers now allow you to pre-sign for things online so be cognizant of that try not to pre-sign for them because essentially that defeats the purpose of the signature requirement they'll just leave it at your door and then you, uh, you can fall victim to the package thefts uh, so checking the ships and options and uh, make sure we pick one um, that's most convenient for you again if you know that you're not going to be there for a couple of days maybe you pick the slower shipping option so that it's going to show, show up at uh, the second half of the week maybe when you're going to be home uh, some people that run a, a home business you know it's part of their business that they buy things online uh, and they're going to be receiving packages on a regular basis so sometimes we'll recommend if, if you're going to be getting packages multiple times per week you know you don't want to be factoring that into your business model of you know 10 percent loss of package theft every year. So maybe it's a good idea to invest in a PO box or like a mailbox, etc., where they can accept packages for you. Uh, and then the last one, which kind of thinking outside of the box, but uh, you can also request with most shipping companies that they not just leave something on your front porch. So if you have a car that's always parked in the driveway, you can just leave a note or you can uh, send them an email, call them, say, hey, leave the car under, I'm sorry, leave the package under the car or put it maybe under the doormat, put it over a fence, something like that where it's not gonna be very common. I'm sorry, we're not very easily uh, seen. Um, unfortunately, when packages are left on a porch, people just driving down the street, everyone knows when there's a package left on the porch, it's the most common place. So I uh, hope you guys found this valuable. We'll take some questions at uh, the end. Thank you. And next, oh, yes. identity theft and scams with uh, Detective Foster. Oop. Not very good at talking into mics and whatnot, so I apologize in advance. Next slide. All right. So I'm one of your two fraud detectives. This is uh, kind of to, to start you flowing. Can, uh, can you tell me what's written up there around that triangle? Pressure, opportunity, rationalization, right? So the pressure, and this is, this is from the crooks. I want you to think like a crook. What's the pressure, right? What's the pressure? You want what? Money, lots and lots of money, right? It could be for greed nationalistic views it could be because you want to buy a mercedes i don't know but that's their pressure right rationalization these are fraudsters what's their rationalization ma'am if i steal your credit card go out and buy a bunch of stuff at target of the hub and you call your credit card and say hey that's not me buying 50 gallons of bird seed at the hub what's what's your credit card gonna do 
They'll send out an alert, but what happens to your money? Are you going to owe the $80,000 of birdseed? No. 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 Now, you're still a victim, a victim of identity theft, because somebody used your, your, your name and your credit card number to buy something, but who's going who's gonna to eat the, the cost? The bank, right? It's a lot of money. So rationalization is what? These crooks are going, I'm not hurting you. I'm not hurting you. I didn't hurt you either, right? It's just big, big bank, you know, like in Fight Club. Let's pull up the credit unions and all that stuff, right? So they rationalize it this way. I'm not hurting the little people. I'm hurting the banks. I don't care. The most important part of this triangle is opportunity. The opportunity is when, and can you guys hear me? Because I can't hear myself. Is that good? Better? Okay. So the opportunity is when they think they can get in your pocket and get in the bank's pocket, right? And th this is what we're going to talk about a little bit is some of the opportunities of when they can get into your pocket, right? And just for your information, this is called Cresney's Fraud Triangle. And it's, it's kind of like our little fraud uh, temple there. Next slide. So, well, I, I put all kinds of neat gimmicks in there because I'm not very good at bullets. So ignore those bullets for now because they were supposed to pop up and do cool stuff, but apparently that didn't work. So grandparent scams. Does anybody know what grandparent scam is? Anybody? What's what's a grandparent scam, sir? Somebody calls up and pretends to be your grandkid. Say, I'm in jail or I just wrecked a car or something. I need money. Send me money. And do it quick. And what time do they usually call? Yeah, yeah, or, you know, oh, dark hundred in the morning, somebody's going to call you up and say, hey, grandpa, and they won't even say their name because they don't necessarily know your grandkid's name. Grandpa, you'll be like, Billy, is that you? Like, yeah, yeah, it is me. It's Billy. That's right. And I'm in jail and I need $10,000. And by the way, I'm going to hand off the phone to Captain Gergarina right here, who's going to tell you how much the bail costs and then he's going to hand the phone off to somebody who sounds very official and says hey i'm captain gergarina and this is what you got to do for the bail and blah 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 right so they've had different versions of this throughout the years and that this also relates to the irs scam how many of you have heard of the irs scam oh yeah that's an oldie but goodie right same thing hey i'm i'm you know special agent you know Buck Rogers from the IRS, and you, sir, owe me $10,000 in back taxes, and you need to go down to 7-Eleven, buy yourself $10,000 in green dot cards, and stick them in that little ATM, and send them to Palm Springs, California. That's the actual case I had, right? Now, I see some of you laughing, but what are they doing when they say this stuff? This goes back, back that's where we're going to start getting into this slide here they're scaring you and they're trying to make you say you gotta act now act now why are they late night commercial anybody an insomniac just me all right we'll talk later uh so i'm an insomniac right what's on tv at night sham wow right what do they gotta do you gotta buy it now buy it now buy it now buy it now because the special officer's offer is gonna be done in five minutes you gotta buy it now and I know I'm a cop, and I'm, I know about psychology. I used to be an interrogator in the United States Army. I know about psychological ploys. I know how to stare down the baddest dude, but gosh darn it, at 3 a.m., I want to buy a ShamWow, right? <laughs> and I got to do it quickly because it's the offer is going to be over, right? And that's the thing, is that they try to get you to act quickly, but you got to resist that, right? You got to take a wave of it. And just an aside, so my family, we're half Irish and half Ukrainian. I'm not going to tell you which half I am. <clears throat> My own grandfather-in-law who lives in Kiev was the victim of the grandparent scam. They were doing it everywhere. It's not just the United States. Everywhere. He had his, somebody coming up calling and saying that, you know, it was his son, Kostya, was in jail and need, he needed to post bail and wire the money, you know. But uh, you need to resist that urge. So great-grandpa for my, my mother or my wife, <clears throat> he resisted the urge to immediately wire the money and he contacted Kostya, his son, and said, Kostya, are you in jail? Kostya said, no, I'm at home. <laughs> you know, I'm at home. Why, am I supposed to be in jail? And, 
you know, hey, somebody called and, you know, they, they figured that it was, it was a, it was a scam. It was all a scam. Wiring money. How many sent money by Western Union? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's convenient and a good way to send money. However, you need to be 100% sure you know who is on the other side of that transaction, right? Otherwise, what happens if you send money by Western Union? Can you get a refund if they send it to the wrong person? No, it's gone. And I get a lot of cases where people have sent money via wire outside of the con- outside of the country because you know it sounds legit if you're going to invest in real estate in St. Petersburg, Russia, and the guy only needs ten thousand down. Uh, you know, but unfortunately, Detective Foster can't get that money back necessarily for you if you wire it, especially if you wire it outside the country because after it leaves the country and it's wired, it's it's gone. It's gone. So never wire money based on a request by phone or an email, especially to overseas. I'm looking, I'm looking at Lagos, Nigeria in particular. <laughs> Wiring money is like giving your cash away. Once you send it, you can't get back. It's gone, right? And this has also been done to military families too. When I was in the service, they used to do this a lot too. They would send uh, emails or messages to military families and they say, hey, Sergeant Foster is over in Iraq. And, oh, we're not getting, we're not getting, uh, we don't have, we didn't get paid our, you know, because they gave us a little stipend, like 200 bucks that we could buy, like, Pop-Tarts and sodas when we're on base camps, right? And, oh, we, we don't have any money, can you, can you wire the money to him and we'll send it through him and he'll get it and then he'll be able to buy his Pop-Tarts and Cokes and, you know, so anybody can be a victim of variations of these scams. The thing is to remember, stop, we used to think, stop, think, observe, plan, proceed, right? So stop think about it. Why am I getting called at 3 a.m. by my grandson, who I thought was home in bed sleeping? Observe, you know, okay, that he's not there. He's in his house after I called him. And then you're going your merry way. That, that kind of ended oddly. Sorry, I apologize. So I've, it happens. All right. So now we're going to go on. That's the grandparent scam. There's variations of the IRS scam. There, it's all basically trying to part you with your beloved money, right? Now we're talking about identity theft. This is the ye old way of getting identity theft, right? Dumpster diving. All right. I found a lady, uh, her uh, her B of A commercial checking account in the hands of some uh, no good nicks, and I could have gone and taken out. $3,181.68 today, if I wanted to. And that was gotten out of the trash. Mail theft. They get your mail. They fill out those all, all those credit card applications you get in the mail. If you just toss them in the trash or you find your mailbox is bro- broken into, they can fill those out. And with a little magic where they, they, they maybe open an account, account in your name and add themselves as a user, or they have the account opened up and then they send it to a slightly different address or wait for it to come in and steal your mail a second time to get that credit card and activate it, right? Give me an example, American Express. American Express sends you a new card after you've been pre-approved and you, you fill out the paperwork and they mail it to your house. Is that card activated or unactivated? Activated. So I'm a crook, I steal your mail, ma'am. Has American Express gold, you know, traveler card in there, uh, application for, I fill that out in your name, doo, 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 doo. mail it in. I come by and check your mailbox every couple days after I see you pull out for work. I see when it comes and I got an activated credit card that I can probably use three to four times before they catch it, before they realize that you don't usually buy $80,000 worth of bird seed continuously. Burglary. You guys mentioned earlier with the burglary, one trend I'm seeing is that the thieves will go in and they walk right past the TV. They go straight to that little fire safe that they were talking about, the lily bitty one, that has you know your birth certificate, social security card, uh, death certificates of family members, maybe some small jewelry, but all kinds of information. Your passport, pop that open and they take it. And I'm dealing with a case right now where I have uh, people from everywhere from Reno to Modesto, to Stockton, to San Jose, to Fremont, and they were all victims of burglary, and I have all their stuff from, and they were opening accounts in their name, and opening, you know, going to Home Depot, and opening an account, and adding themselves as a user, doing all that kind of stuff. All right. So, 
if you when you know this all you're missing uh valuables also remember to look at all your your uh papers too next where are we at okay and so these are the last couple of ones i'm going to talk i could talk for hours and i know uh i know that it's not very entertaining to talk about fraud but uh so these are these are a few last ones email scams right what's kind of an email scam that you can get into Nigeria, we call those uh, 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 fraudulent or purchase order scams, where they where they say, "Hey, I want to buy ten thousand widgets from you, and here's a, here's my credit card number and email." They'll send it all by email, and then they you ship it to this warehouse in Alabama, right? And the al warehouse in Alabama then ships it on to you know whatever country that's being sent to, and then by the time that the fraud is discovered that credit card number by the way was stolen or whatever and then you're out the money because you sold to somebody over you know online and they've already shipped it. it's already out of the country uh there's other versions of it too have you have you all ever seen the ones okay how many here are like fox news people how many are cnn people bbc anybody but you know when all those even the newspaper ones down at the bottom of every article what do they have comments right you know, maybe I read too much, but there's comments at the end of every article, right? And always in, in those comments, it'll be people commenting whatever the article is or whatever the, the thing is on, on the news, whatever they're talking about. But if you look, and I want you guys to go home tonight and check out any one of those websites, Fox News, MSNBC, any of them, look for the comments section, go down, and you'll see regular knuckleheads commenting and giving their little opinions. But then in between, you'll see somebody... Nobody could believe that my auntie made $50 an hour and bought a new Mercedes-Benz working from home. <laughs> click here if interested. That's an email scam. What you do is when you click on that, they get your information, get your email. Say, hey, you want to work for me? What's your name, sir? What's your name? I'm Fred. Fred, you want to work for me? I'm going to make a little contract. It looks really official. All you got to do is I'm going to ship products to you. You're going to take it out of this box. Look at it. Make sure it's good. It's packaged good, right? Then you're going to put it back in the box, tape it back up, put this new label on it, and then mail it on. Sounds legit, right? <laughs> it's going to have an official contract and everything. But what you're really doing is that you're the tail end of that first email scam where they bought products using somebody's stolen credit card. They're sending it to you. You're reshipping it, and now you're shipping it out of the country. Anybody know what a phishing scam is? Yeah, yeah, not the, not the, not the, not, you know, bass kind of fishing, but fishing, fishing. Does anybody have an idea what a fishing scam is? That's, that's one way. That's, that's correct. What? That's more the traditional one, yeah. Exactly. So you'll get an email to your Gmail account that says, Hey, your Wells Fargo account has been compromised. Please log in here and put in your information. And what you're really doing is you're, you're giving access to your account to some Scambodian uh, overseas who's going to get into your account. And, and the thing is that what's one way to tell if you're actually on a, well, one, never click on those, please don't, just don't. But one way that you can tell that you're on a secure connection with your bank, what happens what happens to your little your little message bar up there? What what, what color does it turn? Green. Green. That's supposed to be it means a secure connection. You click on one of those emails, it's not going to be green. That's it. I'm not very good at. Uh, I'm, I'm sweating. Is it hot in here? I get nervous in front of crowds, so I forget. I forget the long ones. I try to keep it simple. I got one more for y'all. Fraud's a lot of fun, huh? So the last one just, oh, well, that's what we can do. But the last one is uh, the credit card fraud. If you're, if you're shopping, when you're shopping online, make sure you're going to reputable sites, you know, uh, Amazon or, or, you know, just ones that you know that aren't, you know, fly by night kind of, hey, I want your, because you're giving them your whole credit card number. Once it's out there, those sites, you know, any of the major shopping, you know, you've heard about some of the big stores have had data breaches, right? Yeah, big ones. So can you imagine if you're going to somebody maybe smaller or maybe somebody who's maybe not as scrupulous 
and they get that same information. Uh, I've been to some classes where I've actually got to see you and they had us call out the first six digits of our credit card number and they went to a page and showed us where it was, where it was uh, breached at, where, like how many credit cards we could buy with that exact same number, except for a little bit. These are, this is some of the, what you can do if you are a victim. And if, if you have a case that you get forward to me or uh, Detective Boyd, you know, we're going to try to contact you. We'll talk to you personally. We'll try to talk to you via email, phone, whatever. And we're going to send you a pamphlet that tells you about, you know, where, where, uh, figure out where the fraud occurred. Because if it's outside of Fremont, we'll try to get the other agency to see if we can get video of who's using the card, et cetera. You're going to want to put a fraud alert on your credit report. You're going to file a report with the Federal Trade Commission and file an online report when no suspect is known at our website at Fremont PD. Uh, there's more resources down at the identitytheft.gov. The online reports, when you file them, it's very helpful. And, and Sergeant McCormick was talking about triaging. It's very important that you give us as much detail. Like if it's an email phishing scam, does anybody, you know, you go in there, you, you say, hey, somebody sent me an email, it said to wire money here. Well, some of the things you need to do for me is to save those emails, the full email, not, not like forward it to me. I need the full email so I can get the full uh, IP address out of that thing and see if I can trace it, right? That's information, and in, when you go home, Google it, because I, I think I'm probably going over my time a little bit here, but, uh, but if, if you have any questions afterwards, let, let me leave it at this. If you have any questions, ask me afterwards, and we'll talk, but when you're a victim of fraud, keep any emails you have, that, if possible, keep any phone numbers, any, any letters, anything like that, account numbers, keep them so that that's going to help me trace them because I'm going to be chasing through, you know, the cyber cyber universe trying to track them down. Okay, so that that kind of helps us. And now I cede my time to whoever's left. Oh, that'd be you. All right, Bubba. Hey, everybody. I'm Detective Brian Holyfield. Um, this is actually the first time I've done one of these meetings. Uh, I've already learned to go before Adam Foster because he's way more entertaining, but I'll try. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about video surveillance. Uh, the other detectives have already mentioned how important it is uh, for our invest investigations. I don't have actual numbers to tell you, but I can tell you that the vast majority of cases that we actually solve and make an arrest on are going to have some type of video surveillance involved somewhere in the case. Uh, if we get a case that has absolutely uh, no video surveillance, the chances of that being solved are probably going to go down a little bit. Uh, let's see, footage can identify suspects. Uh, it can identify their vehicles and also link uh, individual cases to a crime series. Uh, what that means is if, uh, like some of the other detectives mentioned, if we get a good picture of their face, um, a lot of the criminals that we have, we see them over and over again. So we can just look at the photo disseminate it to other officers and pretty much know who the person is uh, sometimes right away. Uh, their vehicles, they often use the same vehicles. The, uh, a lot of the criminals don't have a bunch of money. They think they're, they're going to get a bunch of money, but they end up being broke anyways. Uh, so they have the same car all the time. And so um, we can identify them that way as well. And then individual cases, uh, like I said, sometimes we get a case that maybe we're not going to be able to solve. Uh, but later on down the road, we come across another case that has the same kind of uh, MO and maybe the same car, and we can link uh, all these other crimes to one or two individuals that have been doing uh, crimes all about the city. Uh, modern surveillance systems can be easy to install and operate. So I know that uh, unless you're into it or you know something about the video cameras, they can be kind of intimidating uh, to purchase or even think about going to buy. Um, and there's hundreds of different types and brands and things like that. Uh, but for the most part, even, uh, even the most simple systems, when installed correctly, can be uh, really useful to us. Next. All right, here's some of the types, and there's a, a few on the table back there that I, I saw. Um, the first one would be like a doorbell camera. Um, you guys just heard that most of the time what the burglars will do is they'll come to your front door and knock or ring your doorbell. Make sure you're not home because these guys don't want to find you in the house. Uh, they want nobody to be home, so they have plenty of time to take all your stuff. 
So the simplest one would be uh, just a simple doorbell camera. There's plenty of brands. They're typically really easy to install. And sometimes just seeing that uh, by your front door, they don't want to be on camera. So they're going to leave and pick a different house. Uh, next, uh, the next step up, I would say, would be a, a wireless system. Uh, they're obviously more expensive, um, but they're still really easy to put up. And what they do is just they'll have a central hub that connects to your home's Wi-Fi system. Uh, and then as many cameras as you want, you can just stick them wherever you want throughout the home, inside or out. Uh, you don't have to run wires or anything like that. And it makes it easy for the homeowner to install. Um, typically not the greatest picture, but the ease of installation uh, kind of makes up for that. Uh, one bad thing about the wireless is that typically you'll have to either recharge them uh, every few months or so or replace the batteries. Uh, the next step up would be a hardwired system like, uh, like most of the systems that you see uh, at businesses and things like that. Those are obviously slightly more expensive and uh, you have to run wires to install them so it's more time consuming uh, or you might have to pay someone else to do it. Uh, but what you end up with is a more secure system. Uh, you don't, there's no maintenance involved as far as the batteries are recharging uh, and you can typically get a, a much better picture. So if you want to invest a little more in it, uh, that's what you would end up with. Uh, and finally, all of them, uh, all, all the newer systems do remote monitoring as long as they're hooked up to your uh, Wi-Fi system. And that means that you can set it up for uh, uh, motion or anything like that. And you can get notifications on your phone when people are on your porch or walking around in your driveway. Uh, and that not only does that help with uh, your residential burglaries, but also your vehicle burglaries in the middle of the night. If, uh, if your phone goes off because somebody's walking around your car, it's, uh, it, it might wake you up and you can turn the lights on. Uh, or your package thefts. We see it all the time that uh, these video cameras will be able to notify you when someone drops off a package. So not only can you track your, your shipping, but now you can see the uh, UPS guy or FedEx guy dropping it off on the porch. Uh, and then hopefully, but possibly, you'll see the guy taking the package after they've dropped it off. Uh, so those are things to, to take into account. Uh, some things to think about. Place the cameras in a way that will show a person's face when possible. And later on in, in the presentation, there's some examples of that. Uh, a lot of people will tend to put them really up high uh, under the eaves of the roof, and they'll want to see the whole yard with one camera. Well, that's gonna, what that's going to show you is that, yes, indeed, someone did break your window, and they were wearing a, a white, or white shirt or something but it's not gonna show their face and it's gonna be a very general description of who did it. Uh, if you place the cameras in a way that catches someone's face, like if you have an entryway to the front door, uh, or if you're gonna do one by the side gate, if you put it slightly lower, uh, pointing right at the gate, then you're gonna get a, a much better shot of the person. And again, we can use that to identify them. Um, your front door, your side gate, and the exterior doors are places that are likely to be targeted. Uh, front door would be first, as we've already talked about a couple of times. After that, they're going to go to your side gate and try to get in the backyard because then your, the neighbors won't see them and they can take their time. And then they're probably going to check the door first. If the door's unlocked, they don't have to climb through a window. So in that order, those are places that you want to put a camera. Uh, if you have more cameras than that, a camera that covers the street can be used to identify the suspect's vehicle. Like I said, they use the same car all the time. Even if we have other ones that, uh, that we didn't get any video, but we just had a witness say that there was a red, red car, uh, and we had three burglaries that day, all with a red car, chances are it's all the same person. Uh, and then you can use the camera to capture license plate images if possible. Uh, th this is obviously a, one more step above, uh, but some people have enough cameras and uh, good enough quality of cameras that they could put them closer to the street and just capture a close-up of vehicles going up and down the street. Um, now, that can do a couple of things. It can uh, help you if there's a burglary down the street. Uh, you know, obviously, we usually come around and knock on everybody's door and ask if they saw anything or they have cameras. And even if the camera didn't capture the actual crime, now we know, you know, which cars went down the street within the 10-minute period before that burglary. Um, and a license plate can really speed up the process of us uh, solving the case. Oh, and finally, I, I couldn't see it, but test your cameras. A lot of people will install the cameras, uh, you know, set it and forget it. And then three years down the road, we come by and we're like, hey, we want to check out your cameras. Uh, something happened to your neighbor's house. 
and they go, oh, well, half of them aren't working, I don't know the password, stuff like that. Try to get to know how to use the cameras because you can use them to benefit you, tracking pack packages, keeping an eye on who's at your house. You know, uh, if the kids come home from school or something and nobody's home, you can see them get home safe. But also, later on when we need it, it's actually there. So you didn't invest the time and money, and you don't get the satisfaction of knowing that it's going to help us arrest somebody that either broke into your house or your neighbor's house. Uh, this is what I was talking about with uh, the placement of the cameras. Um, the one on the left is probably somebody put it above their, their front door up in the corner of the entryway. Uh, seems like a good idea until you go and test your camera after you've installed it. Then you're going to look at it and say, well, okay, it's a guy and he's wearing a black hat and a black shirt. And that's really all you're going to have. So what seemed like a good idea isn't really going to help a whole lot. If you place them a little, little bit lower in an area that's likely to have foot traffic, uh, then you get something more like what's on the right. And as you can see, those guys, if they're uh, criminals that, that we could recognize, we're going to know exactly who did it. And that also helps later when we get our confession from them. If they say, no, I wasn't there, and, and you show them that picture, okay, well, you're kind of done at that point, right? <clears throat> uh, this is a, a quick a little image showing placement of some of the cameras. Um, I just took a picture of a random house uh, on the internet and then placed uh, where it would be a good spot to put your first four cameras. Uh, the first one I would do is right there at the front door as you can see because that's going to get uh, the most bang for your buck. Uh, the next one I would do is probably over my driveway because as we know uh, during the day we get the residential burglaries. At night that's, where they, that's when they're going to break into your car. Uh, so uh, put one above your driveway as well and then each side gate because that's where they want to be is in your backyard for for privacy and taking their time if you can get a good picture of them going in your in your backyard that'll help a lot you don't need to see that they broke the window we're going to be able to to tell that just by the broken window and then finally if you go onto the Fremont Police website there's a couple of things that uh, can help you if you're thinking about looking into video cameras uh, for your home and you don't know where to start, um, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a tab uh, under programs there on the top, and there's a couple of links for guides for video cameras, and then also a link to uh, our community camera project, which uh, several communities in the city of Fremont have gotten, uh, gotten started. And what it is is uh, somebody will organize it, and if there's three streets that go in and out of the whole neighborhood, and everybody pitches in well you could just cover those three uh you know entrances to the neighborhood and that way we can see every car that goes in and out of the neighborhood we won't see the actual crime if it didn't uh, happen to somebody that has their own cameras but in that time period before that we'll see who's coming and going and again be able to see the car which we're, we're probably going to recognize as well and i think that's about it uh, if any anybody has anything else and uh, Sergeant McCormick can close thank you very much um, that is going to be the end of our presentation uh, the presentations so because this is being live streamed uh, it's going to be on the city's website for future use uh, we'll open it up to questions but we'll do it the old Phil Donahue style and I'll run up and down the aisle with the microphone and if we can have the detectives come up front and if somebody has a question, we'll put you on the mic, and uh, one of the detectives will. Uh, well, no, no, I'll I'll do the running. You guys, you guys can answer all the questions. Um, so we'll just have some uh, quick question and answer period, and uh, and then we'll conclude the night. And again, uh, I want to say thank you very much for coming out, and really putting forth the effort to making your neighborhood and our city a much safer place. So with that, we'll start with our first question over here. <clears throat> uh, this is for you. Um, how common is it? You know, uh, I've heard about these little, uh, these little cubes that'll read your credit cards and, and it steals the number basically so that somebody can then, you know, sell that number up the road somewhere. You're talking um, about the skimmers and stuff skimmer, like that. Skimmer, that's what I'm thinking of. Is that fair? Is that common? Very... So there's technology that, keep in mind, I was a soldier, I'm a cop now, I am not a banker. And I'm not a bank technologist. However, uh, a lot of you have probably started getting chipped cards, right? 
So those chipped cards are supposed to kind of help counteract the skimmers that you're talking about. Uh, they are more prevalent, uh, you know, they come in waves, right? So somebody, usually it comes from south to north. So it'll start down south in the LA area, all of a sudden all the 76 stations are getting skimmers placed in there because some crook figured out how to hide a skimmer in a gas pump. And then after a while they start getting hip to that down there and they start doing it up here in our area, right? Uh, but those chips, so it's like, uh, you know, a constantly evolving rat that's, we have to keep making a better trap for, right? So, uh, you know, the chips are supposed to help for the skimmers, uh, but there's always newer and, and smarter crooks that figure out a way to get around the latest security. Uh, best thing is, is, you know, don't use your debit card at gas pumps. That's for one, because that's one of the main things and what's a, an, another place that you might want to not use your debit card or let it out of your view you go to the restaurant any place pretty much where somebody says oh sure i'll take your credit card and then they just walk away right and you don't see them and it could be it could be anywhere right so keep it in view is a good thing right does that answer your question sir yeah. any other questions i'll go over Um, several times on TV I've seen where uh, when they try to break into a car with the automatic key fob, if you, if you hit the, um, when you're locking it, if you hit it a couple of times, it changes the, the sequence or something so they, they are not as um, easily break, to break in. Is, is, does you guys ever heard of that? Is that correct? I personally haven't had any cases with that. Have you guys? So you never heard of it. It's probably I've not never true. heard of it, and I've never seen it come across. That doesn't mean that it's not possible. Um, it's just not something seen often or possibly okay. even at all here. This is for you. <laughs> You're a popular man. Um, you uh, spoke about mail theft. So how do we know? Whether you know, like uh, some of us, like I, I noticed, like some of the neighborhoods, we they have their mailboxes right against their front door, near their front door. Mm -hmm. Some are required to have it out on the street. So, so wouldn't that be easier for? Yes, actually, yes. So there's many times we get video where all we can see is a blurred out license plate. Somebody in a car pulls up. They literally reach out, wink, and take your mail best way to get that is there's certain types of mailboxes that you can buy commercially that you have to unlock. Now, keep in mind, like I said, the rat's always evolving, right? So they, they might come and, you know, you'll see them. I, I know I showed a picture where they're prying open the thing, right? And sometimes they figure out, they'll use shave keys and they'll, they'll figure out ways, but you try to make yourself, right? Uh, what was it my, my, my grandfather used to always say? You know, the, the best way to not get beat up is to be a tiger, not a sheep, right? Because Another tiger comes around, he doesn't want to eat the tiger because you got teeth and claws, right? He wants to eat the sheep. So to make that into reality, make your mailbox tougher, right? So get the kind where you have to use a key to open it up and the mailman slides the stuff, or mail person, I'm sorry, slides it into the slot and you, know, you can't fit your hand down through the slot. Or uh, like in my house, I have it on the garage, so you have to go in and there's another flap inside there that closes so that it's kind of like the old vending machines. You know what I'm talking about? So when the mail carrier comes along, sticks it through there and they can't reach in. But yeah, you're, you're correct. That's how 90% of them get it is they just open your mailbox. But then they also go to the apartment complexes and they'll, and they'll damage the mailboxes or they'll have keys and stuff like that. So make, make yourself a harder target and they're gonna go Mess with somebody else. So if we get the the ones that lock up, then we give a copy of the key to the postal service? Well, that, that's what I'm saying is that there's ones that are designed oh. that they lock up so that the mail carrier can slide your mail in to them, right? But they don't. you don't have to open the door. It's not like, you know, the old fashioned one that's, you know, the, the horseshoe shape with the door and the little flag. Uh, it might still look like that, except now it's locked and there's just a slot cut in the top and you can put mail into it, kind of like a piggy bank, right? 
and they put the mail into it and then only you have the key to unlock it and take the mail out something like that there's different commercial brands and designs and like i said they're always thinking of new ways to thwart those guys right okay. does that help thank you yep Yeah, most of your, your, if you go to Home Depot, Lowe's, they'll have a whole array of uh, postal boxes, and, and most of them are approved by the U.S. Postal Service. Um, and just to kind of dovetail off of what Adam said, how many people still put outgoing mail in their mailboxes? Okay, good. Don't do that, please. Because what you're doing is you're telling somebody, hey, there's something valuable in my mailbox. Please come and take it. And I know years ago people used to pay their bills, uh, you know, with a check, and they would sit the 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 check in the in the mail and the and hopefully the postal person would come but what's happened is that what you're doing is you're just alerting the crook to, that there's something in my mailbox please come and take it so um, you know go to the post office you know drop it off at the local uh, postal repository but do not use your postal your own post office or your your own post box as a way of, of sending out mail so are there any other questions. All right, good. We get all right. We'll, we'll go right down the line here. Yeah, uh, I had a question with lock uh, gates. I've had policemen uh, uh, knock on my door, and say, "Can we get through?" There's a you know, guy jump your 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 uh, you know, jump your fence. I have to go get the key, unlock it, and let the, the officer in. By then, he's probably three or four houses over. And uh, is that have you come across that uh, now? Everyone putting locks on their gates. No, <coughs> you, you, um, so the question is, are, is that a becoming a common thing, people locking up their side gates? Yeah, and then you guys try and get the perpetrator in. We're, we're recommending that just so that the, the homeowners can secure their houses a little bit better. Um, as far as police, if we need to get over or through that gate somehow, yeah. um, we're probably going to figure out a way to get through that or over that fence one way or the other. Um, so the, the, the purpose of us recommending you put locks on, on the side gates is to make your houses less attractive to, to, to suspects so that, like we're saying here, if, if somebody is knocking on your door and they don't think anybody's home, jumping over a fence in the middle of the day where a lot of people can possibly see you depending on where you live is way more, con you know, way more suspicious than just popping that, that door and just sliding in the back. It's, it, um, it's just one more preventative measure that just to consider. We're not saying that, you know, it, it works every time. It, it doesn't. But we're telling you that it's, you know, it's, it's one more way to make your house less attractive to be burglarized. One more comment is people leave their their trash bins out right against the gate. It's like, oh, great, thanks. I can just jump right over. I mean, in the city of Fremont, they want you to put it behind the gate. I think that's like, uh, I think it's the, not the law, but it, it's the, what you're supposed to do. But I see a lot of people hanging right up the gates. So it's like, great, thanks. It helps me jump over. Yeah, time. if you see your neighbors doing that, you might want to recommend to them that yeah. is not a very good way to do business. You may want to just pull them back behind the gate. Thanks. You're welcome. Can you guess who this is going to go to? To our Ukrainian fraud expert. Here you go, we have Adam. a big hand for him. He's working so hard. Placebo <laughs> Bolshoi. Okay. Um, I've had my ID credit card skimmed twice. Uh, they both, well, one was in Fremont, one was up in Vallejo. Uh, they were resolved. Uh, we found out that I bought tacky. Diamond Julie on the shopping channel, but shopping channel, home shopping channel, sends you a printed receipt, at least used to. And that's what I found out I also paid electrical bills in Jacksonville, Florida. That all got taken care of. The latest one is I went to a restaurant in Vallejo, and the credit card company said, did you go to uh, Jordan and buy three or four surfboards yesterday and then go to North Carolina and buy whatever? And that got resolved. Now, is that any, uh, these have all been taken care of. Is that of any interest to you just for statistics or should I just kind of let it go because it was taken care of? So, let me think. <laughs> Are they of interest to us? Yes, statistically speaking. Because what more than likely happened is somewhere, wherever the breach is, whether you got skimmed or the business where you use your card, somebody hacked their system somehow and got their customer information, right? So instantly, what you're telling me is that over here they're buying surfboards. Over here they're mm -hmm. buying my favorite bird seed. Mm -hmm. Over here is buying whatever, right? What happened with, to your card after the breach, which I don't know what, how the breach occurred, but what happened to your card after your breach is it? How many of you know about the dark web? It's not like the dark force is mm -hmm. dark web, right? 
Tor and all that kind of stuff. They have these call, these websites where they're called like CVV dump sites. Uh, you know, they, they have your whole credit card information. So once you, the breach occurred at that business, however your credit card was breached, once your information was breached, it got posted on that website and dudes with bitcoins, I don't know, I guess, I guess you can't really put them in your hand, they're not real, but people with bitcoins go out and they buy 100 credit cards and it has a probability rating next to it. It says, hey, this is a John Smith's credit card and it's a Bank of America Visa Gold and it has a 68 probability uh, rating of you being able to successfully use it. And they'll buy like 100 of those. And then let the shopping begin. Uh, one thing I, I, I didn't mention during my initial presentation, because I was a little nervous, uh, was uh, the National Institute of Justice compiles statistics, right? Uh, they, they, they're part of the uh, Department of Justice, right? And one of the statistics they do is, you know, every couple of years they go, okay, how much money is lost for burglary? How, many, how much money is lost through auto burglary? Uh, petty theft, etc. right? Between, I think it was 2013, 2014, and you can check the National Institute's uh, website later to check my facts. But it was about $25 billion was the loss through fraud, ID theft, credit card fraud, wire fraud, $25 billion. It was about $15 billion for all the other ones combined. So my credit card gets stolen. The credit card company makes me whole, right? I don't owe any money. But before, before that fraud was discovered, the crook used that card maybe a three, four times, right? Three, four times and, and got a couple, couple grand. Now, if I can get any of y'all's identifying information, your name, date of birth, social security number, how many people in this room right now about? I'd say probably 30, 40, right? Per person, I could make 11 grand off each of you. Just if I get your name, date of birth, social security number, address, maybe wife's name or something like that. And that's all, where, where can I get that stuff? Y'all on Facebook? Good, good on you if you're not. I'm not either. I'm terrified of that thing. But if you go on there and now you know my wife's name is, you know, Emily. And now you know some of my other information. Now you start building credit cards in my name, right? 11 grand. So 11 grand, if there's 40 people in here, that's a lot of money, right? That's a lot of money. And I can do it all while sitting down in that chair eating Cheetos in my slippers and bathrobe, right? That's, that's easy money, right? So... Does that answer your question kind of? Like, that's what happened. Some guy or gal or person eating Cheetos in their bathrobe got, bought your credit card off of a website and then started buying it. And then they pass it around after they use it. Because, you know, once I use it the first time, now it's not worth as much. So I'll just resell it back on another CVV site. And then somebody else will buy it for Bitcoin. It's like a recurrent thing. These are the kind of things, if, if, it's, if your credit card is used in St. Petersburg, Russia, can Officer Foster get you your money back or solve that crime? No. What do you all think? No. No. I can tell you it was in St. Petersburg, Russia, and you might not have known that. But the FBI has a, something called IC3, which is the Internet Complaint Center. And eventually, either your online report that you file at the website for the Fremont PD will get sent to the IC3 Center, and then they'll... they'll they basically keep track of it. They want to see trends because that's how we beat these guys. We start seeing trends of which way they're going, how they're hooking people through fishing expeditions and how they're doing data breaches on these big companies, right? And, uh, and it, I'm not going to even pre pretend to understand all of it, but they crunch those numbers and they figure out where those trends are and uh, go from there. Does that help, Daniel? Okay, so would you be interested in my cases, even though they've been taken care of? As an as a online report, yes. Okay. And especially if you're doing, if there's potential for future fraud, you want to have that report <laughs> on file so that, with FTC, so that you can go and say, I'm a victim of identity theft, and this is my fraud affidavit, okay? Okay, I will never go back to that restaurant. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, good evening. Um, I'm relatively new to Fremont. Recently, I subscribed to Nextdoor.com and have a few uh, notifications that there are armed robberies in Fremont. I have two questions, and this question is not directed to anyone specifically. Question number one, do you see a trend that Fremont is becoming more unsafe lately? And question number two is, what advice do you have for us if we face armed robbers? Well, I think I'll address that question. So the, the first question is, Fremont becoming less safe? No. No, like I said at the beginning of the presentation, we are a safe community. Um, if you look statistically in comparison with other cities within the Bay Area, you'll find that we're one of the safest cities in the nation and one of the safest cities in the Bay Area, which is not to say that violent crime doesn't visit us, because it does. Um, but I can tell you that uh, if, you, if you look at the stats, that uh, we are, again, one of the, the safest cities in the nation. Um, and again, that goes back to your efforts as a community to uh, calling in those suspicious people and having the video surveillance and coming forth and being good witnesses. And then it also goes back to the detectives and the officers out there who are providing those that level of service to uh, catch those offenders. So rest assured, Fremont is a safe community. You'll see things in the news and the media will, will put out information and it may look like that there is an epidemic of violent crime um, but if you look at the, the numbers and, and if you go dig a little deeper, um, you'll find that, that Fremont is overall a very safe community. <clears throat> what advice would I give you in facing a robber? Um, basically, remember that property can be replaced. Money can be earned back. Uh, your, your possessions can all be gotten back. Uh, what can't be changed is if you or a loved one is injured um, so I would, I, the, the, the advice I would give to you and to anybody would be to comply as best as you can to what, whatever it is that the person's asking for, be a good witness and try to get as much information, detailed information that you can about the perpetrator and then call the police, uh, as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, but we never encourage anybody to resist or to take matters into their own hands because you never know, um, what that individual is capable of and, and how desperate he or she may be. So. Um, hopefully that provides you with some guidance um, and, you know, let us catch the bad guys. That's our job. That's what, we're, that's what you're paying us uh, to do. So let us catch the bad guys. You just be a good witness and, and do the best that you can, okay? Um, any other? Oh, we have. Just to add to that, um, the Fremont Police Department's overall really good at pushing out information on Nixel and, and all the other uh, social media that we use. And if you think about it, uh, a lot of the other cities in, in the area and really overall uh, really don't do that as much as we do. We have people at the police department, that's all they do is, is make you guys aware of what's going on. Uh, so I've, time and time again I see someone, you know, I'll, I'll be on a call or contact somebody and I'll say, hey, uh, try out Nixel and just, and just see what's going on. And then they'll, they'll, you know, subscribe to Nixel and then the next time I see them they'll say, I had no idea all this stuff was going on in Fremont. And, it, you know, now that you know everything that's going on, it might make you seem, uh, make it seem like there's more crime, but nothing changed. Now you're just aware of it. So just think of in the other cities, especially ones that have a reputation for more crime, just imagine if they did that, uh, you know, their Nixle would be all over the place. So, uh, but also with that feeling, it makes you more aware. So, uh, you know, somebody that's typically on Nixle and paying attention to the crime trends, uh, they're more likely to see something and more likely to call us too. Um, this is kind of related to the credit card. Um, so once uh, I, I mean, like I, I used to buy tickets and things online. Uh, and uh, once I, de like I decided to like, oh, let me, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, search for my name, but Google my name, right? And I noticed like there was one website out there that had the exact information. It, it records or stores the exact information with all the information, like the credit card information and everything out there that when I bought the ticket or whatever, you know. So are there websites out there that... Um, so it depends on the... On, so the, the businesses have a duty 
to protect your information. It's like a social contract. You're, you're spending money at my business. I have a social obligation to protect your personal information and your credit card information. However, there are breaches, right? And once those breaches are out there, they never go away. They, they're there forever. You know, that, that's why we have, that's why, you know, this, this generation of, 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 you know, high school and junior high and elementary kids are growing up with the internet here. We're, we're seeing a lot of social adjustment because they're just realizing that stupid stuff you do as a kid is still going to be on the internet when you're an adult, right? And the same thing is at some point in time, and I'm guessing because when you do your Google search, at some point in time, your information was breached, right? Uh, and I mean, it wasn't just mine. It was like everyone's. Yes. Right. And, th and they got it on there and somehow it's, it's still going to be there. Now, hopefully that credit card is not being used. It's not your current credit card number, and et cetera. Because usually after these breaches, first thing you need to do is notify your banks and all that and get a new credit card and close out the other one. Right. But, but that's what, it, once it's out there, it's there. And it'll keep circulating around and around and around. But how do you get from where, like, she's buying tickets to this weird website that keeps saying anything? Well, so, first off, the thing I'd ask is, where did you buy it? Is it, is it a big business that was breached by professional hackers? Because these, you know, w <laughs> there are groups of people out there that wish you ill, <laughs> okay? That, that want to take your stuff. And they are very smart at times, and they will put a, a, a large amount of time and energy and resources into figuring out ways to get into somebody else's computer system by like what I mentioned the email phishing or doing other things like that those guys might have gone to the business wherever whether it was an airline whether it was a travel agency those guys might have gone in there somehow gotten into that business got their customer information and once they have it they have it now as far as just being able to see like a document with that stuff printed, that's probably an old legacy thing that they were passing around at some time because now the way they post that credit card information is very interactive. I've used it. I've gone on, I've gone on the dark web and I've gone, you know what, I'll make a credit card today. Boop, boop, boop. Because they wanted us to know how to do it. And it's very, you just touch screen and buy, use your Bitcoins and you, you can, away you go. So it's not, it's not just like a document anymore. So that's probably a legacy uh, from some web page where they they had that information stored but you know it was from a data breach at some point at one of the business wherever you use that card and and i nothing is safe it, it just depends that's why you have to know who you're dealing with you know even though it's the internet you still want to know that if i'm buying you know chewing gum that I'm buying it from somebody that actually has a license to make chewing gum and didn't just scrape it off the street, right? You want to buy it from a reputable site that has secure connections like the green, like your bank does, and that, that has that social contract saying, I'm going to protect your information, right? Not, you know, Jim Bob's house of bubble gum. You want to go to Target or whatever that has a social contract. Well, but everybody, everybody, like I said, they're always, it's like an arms race. They're always trying to get better and we're always trying to defend. And they, and they just got to make themselves better and try to protect your information better, right? That, that's a smart idea, too, and I've heard people using, like, the prepaid uh, cards, too. They put money on a prepaid Visa gift card and then use that for their Internet shopping. So. All right, so we have time for maybe one or two more questions if they're out there. Let me just get this young lady back here real quick. Uh, one time when I was on vacation, I made a request to uh, the post office to stop the delivery. But my mails did not stop until a couple of days I returned from vacation. Uh, so my question is, if I'm thinking about to install uh, the mailbox behind the garage door so the mail can be inserted and delivered into my uh, garage, 
instead of having it on the by the side uh, sidewalk in front of my house, do you think that uh, would that workable or, or or if I do so, am I against anything or? Thank you. I, I'm gonna admit I'm not a postal inspector or a post post person. Uh, I know that they'll they'll work with you. And they, they have, you know, I would go to the U United States Postal Service website and they'll give you suggestions just like we did for your mailbox specifically on how to secure it and how to set it up that will help prevent theft like that. But, but it, it sounds, it's basically what I'm doing. I have it in my garage door and it falls down so that unless you're uh, Gumby and can bend your, uh, bend your arm around, you're not going to get my mail. And it has, a, I have a big cardboard box where it slides down into and we, when we're gone, we've never had a problem, but something like that. But the thing is, my request to the post office to stop the delivery, and they didn't honor my request until a couple of days later after my finished it. So yeah, that's, I, I, I can't answer to that because I'm not a U United States postal worker, <laughs> unfortunately. But What I would recommend, you live in Fremont? Yeah. I would go down to your local post office and talk to the, the the postmaster who works there and explain to him or her the situation, um, because I know there are certain requirements as far as how they how they they deliver the mail, and you want to make sure that you're in compliance with that. That way, you still get your mail. Um, but yeah, it, it it sounds like there was maybe a mix up or a, or a confusion on the uh, on that end because I've done the same thing. I've gone away for vacation, and generally they're they're really good about holding your mail, and then you can either have it start up service and they deliver it all at once, or you can go down. And, and physically pick it up and, and start service again. So, um, but yeah, I would, my suggestion would be go to your local postmaster and get some guidance from him or her as far as what the best way to, to utilize your garage as a, a repository. And okay, so I think we're gonna go with one last question here and then we'll, we'll wrap it up the evening. I was just going to mention that I've been reading more and more in the last year and a half probably where there's people walking down the streets and and they actually take their gold jewelry, their necklaces, and things like that. It's been more in the news. Just from people walking, taking a walk during the day. Not much you can do about that. Yeah, we did a presentation on that. Um, that That is, and that kind of comes in, in trends. Um, we've, we've seen what you call them chain snatches, where usually women are walking down the street and someone will come up and take the chain off them. And the reason why is because, as we alluded to earlier in the, in the presentation, is that, you know, gold is, is very valuable. And it's easily dealt with. It's easily um, melted down very quickly. In fact, uh, we had a case maybe about four or five months ago where we, we had a suspect that we thought was committing these crimes. And we were, uh, had, him, had him under surveillance. He committed a chain snatch. And within 10 minutes of the crime, he was already walking into a, um, a gold shop here in, in Newark and had already sold the gold and was walking out with the money. So uh, we were able to capture him. We got the gold back. Uh, we made the, the victim whole again. But that just tells you how quickly these crimes can occur. And it really, there, is a, there is a real market out there for, for gold. And like anything else, you, know, you, you take a pendant or a ring or some piece of valuable jewelry it's sold, and most likely it's sold to, to one of the more unscrupulous gold merchants. And what they do is they can melt it down real quickly, and now your gold ring is part of a gold bar, and it's very difficult to trace. So that we do see that happening, um, but it comes in, in waves. And usually it's, it's one uh, a group of individuals, and once we identify them and capture them and put them in, in, into custody, we'll see that, that trend go down. And it, it kind of comes and goes and comes and goes. Um, there really is no rhyme or reason as to why they start or stop. So um, hopefully that addresses your, your question. And again, I think one of the takeaways from this, this uh, presentation is to, one, use common sense. You know, one of the things that we talked about during the presentation was uh, a lot of, uh, a quarter of our burglaries are accomplished because people leave their windows unlocked. They leave their windows open. Um, use common sense. If you're going to leave something open, you're inviting someone into your home. You, would, you wouldn't go to the grocery store and leave your car unlocked or your car open. So why would you leave your home and leave your home unlocked or your home open? So use common sense. Um, the other issue is um, 
you know, if, if someone wants to get into your house, if someone wants to get into your car, if someone wants to get into your credit, they're going to do that. Um, the, the technology is out there for our convenience, for our ease, but it's also technology that's, that's uh, manipulated by crooks to help them accomplish their, their crimes. So what we ask is that you take steps to make it more difficult. So we call it target hardening. So putting up those video surveillance cameras, locking those gates, you know, taking your valuable items and putting them underneath your seat or putting them in your trunk or leaving them at home, you know, making it so much more difficult But a lot, because a lot of these crooks, what they're looking for is they're looking for the quick and easy. And if I can walk down a row of cars and I can see someone's laptop case that's probably going to contain a laptop on the front seat and I can get that by breaking a window and get that in less than five seconds, I'll do that. I'll run that risk. But if I if I don't know what's in there, then I'm not going to, I'm going to move on down the line because somebody, and it's a, it's a sad comment, but you know, you don't want it to be you. You want it to be the next person down the line. So make your target as, as difficult and unappealing as possible. And let maybe that guy will go down, down the line. And then finally, I open this up with uh, the fact that it is a, it is a collaboration between us and, and, and the citizens. And we rely so much upon you to help us accomplish our work because you know who your who your neighbors are. You know your neighborhood, and you know while we're out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, patrolling the streets and answering those calls for service, we're not as intimate uh, with your neighborhood as you are. So we rely upon you uh, to make those calls when you see something going down, and you feel that something's not right. Uh, give us that call and let us go out there and make that determination as to whether or not there is criminal activity afoot or not. And you know through that collaboration, we can help. Uh, keep Fremont a very safe, safe neighborhood and a safe community. So if we can get one more uh, round of applause for all the detectives that were up here. I think that concludes our, our presentation for the night. Uh, we'll stick around for a few minutes if, there, if there's any one-on-one -on -one questions, but uh, we do have to get home to our families and then back to work tomorrow. So uh, thank you once again for coming, and I, and I, uh, I had a, a very enjoyable evening.